Sure. Yeah. But the, um, the also very not surprising to me uh, results of it lowering inflammation is one of my uh, obsessions with sulforaphane, generally speaking. I'm, uh, I'm very interested in anything in, in my diet, in my lifestyle that I can do that will uh, lower the amount of systemic inflammation that I have in my body. And, and sulfur, it's been shown in, uh, you've shown this and others have shown that, you know, even broccoli sprout extract powder given to people can lower C-reactive protein levels by as much as 20%. Other inflammatory cytokines, IL-6, can be lowered by something similar. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's, it's having a robust and measurable effect in people, um, you know, that's been repeatable in, in several different studies that I've seen. But one of the reasons I'm so interested in this is because, well, inflammation really you know, plays a role in a lot of diseases like cancer, but it really seems to be a driver of the aging process. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you've, uh, I think I mentioned to, this to you briefly, but I actually think that sulforaphane may be a anti-aging compound. Uh, it's one of the reasons I'm obsessed with sprouting and taking it. Um, I think it actually not only is it uh, preventing these diseases like cancer, but also maybe actually delaying the aging process by activating NRF2, which then activates all these anti-inflammatory genes, activates antioxidant genes, including all the glutathione-related enzymes. I don't know if you've seen this study, but um, I think I also mentioned to you that I would love to see some lifespan studies done um, in animals. I know those are not easy to do. They take a long time. But um, there was a study ha that was done in this red flower beetle. Have you seen this study? No. Okay, no. so let me tell you. Okay. So there's a red flower beetle. Um, yes, it's it's a bug, but they have an they have an NRF2 gene that's yeah. you know homologous to humans. Um, also, the Foxo gene as well. Mm -hmm. So they the scientists fed these um, red flower beetles uh, different doses of uh, broccoli sprout extract, mm -hmm. and the doses were ranged from I don't, it was hot low to high. I can't yeah. re recall. Yeah. But it was a dose response. Uh -huh. And what they found is that um, at the, I think it was at the highest dose, mm -hmm. these, it extended the lifespan of these beetles by 15%. Mm -hmm. And on, when, they put, uh, when they expose these beetles to um, high oxidative stress all the time by keeping them in a warmer environment constantly, mm -hmm. it extended their lifespan by 30%. Wow. And it was totally dependent on NRF2. So that if they knocked down NRF2, the lifespan extension went away. So I was like, wow. this is a great teaser, yeah. right? Yeah. Because if it's happening, and I mean, obviously it's a bug, but it's the same gene, they have a homologous gene, you know, and yeah. if it's extending this lifespan of this critter that has the same similar gene that we have, then I, I feel like there's potential there. That's, that's fascinating. No, I wasn't for me. So I'll send you the paper. Please, I have to ask you, is this a red beetle that likes flowers or a beetle <laughs> that likes red, red flower. flowers? It okay. eats red okay. flower. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, well, that's, that's absolutely fascinating. I, I, look, I can, I can give you some, some anecdotes and tell you of some, some false starts that, that we were involved with. And I say false starts because since they haven't resulted in publications, I, uh, you know, their, their work's not finished. But we have talked with, with uh, colleagues at the National Institute of Aging um, about, for example, looking at Centenarians. There, there's the, there's a Baltimore centenarian centenarian Centurion. centenarian project. Um, so there are collections of people who've made it to the to the ripe old age of a hundred and more. Aren't they a beautiful cohort to look at the NRF2 induced genes in? And I'm I I would be surprised if this hasn't been done already. We've talked about it for years, um, and and I know we've talked about doing it in animals. Um, but doing precisely as you suggest, you know, the, here's, a, here's a cohort of very old people who are quite healthy. Um, do they have some, you know, everybody wants to know, is there something magic about that? But are the NRF2 inducible cytoprotective genes uh, part of that equation? And we suspect that they might be. Um, the, 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 the prolonged lifespan experiments would pretty much have to be done in mice. And again, there's someone at the, uh, there's, a colleague that I know we've talked to at the Institute of Aging who was interested in doing that. I'm not sure if that ever, if that ever happened. Um, we, I had, a, I had a high school student who wanted to do a project here a number of years ago 
and we got her working on nematodes, Cinerabditis, which is a which is a um, a common uh, experimental vehicle for those interested in looking at lifespan because its lifespan is so short and it cycles quickly. Um, I did a lot of work on uh, C. elegans um, when I was uh, did you? before I went to grad school, lifespan studies. Well, we ought to get together and do this experiment <laughs> again if it hasn't been done. You know, one of the problems with sulforaphane research nowadays is I can't keep up with it all. No one can really keep up with it all because there are two or three papers a week coming out on sulforaphane and quite a few more on the NRF2 pathway. I mean, if you try to be be a renaissance person and know all the literature in this field, um, it, it's, it's going to smoke you because um, there are thousands, there are, I think, a couple of thousands of papers a year on NRF2. So, you, so it's very difficult to keep track of them all, and, it, and it's possible that someone has done those lifespan experiments with C. elegans. Again, we... St we started, we, only, we didn't have much muscle in it. We had a high school student who then had to go data? back to... I didn't um, see anything in the literature, by the way. I looked for C. elegans. Yeah, I yeah. didn't see anything with sulforaphane that um, was published. No, we don't have any preliminary data from that student. We also had, I'm looking on my shelf for the binder. It may not still be here. We, um, we had a colleague um, who, was a, who was a bona fide expert on C. elegans who... Um, was going to do some studies, and I'm not sure that that ever happened or if those were ever published. So, yeah, sorry. I, I mean, I yeah. wish I wish I could jump up and down. But with do you agree great... with me here? I mean, we're, oh, just yeah, knowing yeah. what we know about you know how how sulforaphane is, as you mentioned, the most potent dietary that we know of activator of the NRF2 yeah. system, and knowing what we know, we do know that NRF2 does play a role in delaying aging. Uh, in brain aging, in yes. um, you know tissue aging, you know there's there's it's it's literally lowering inflammation and reducing oxidative stress. These things cause aging. Right. So let me let me come back at you with a short story about progeria, a disease of extreme aging or extremely accelerated aging, and let me also come back at you on the issue of, um, of uh, brain inflammation, neuroinflammation, because there is evidence in both of those cases, and that actually does speak to the aging issue. I mean, I think we'd both like to see someone do a study on centenarians or on C. elegans and just have a dramatic finding um, that lifespan is, ex is extended. Um, uh, maybe, maybe that's coming. But... Um, so the progeria study is that we got a very small grant um, to look at a very terrible condition called progeria, or Hutchinson's Guilford, Hutchinson Guilford's progeria syndrome. This is a disease that is um, uh, is characterized by accumulation of a protein called progeria, which is actually a, a mutant protein that has. A, Again, I'm not sure if your audience is ready for this, but a farnesylation, a, a farnesyl tag on it. So, basically, so, a marker that's on top of the. Yeah, sort of. <laughs> so, so, so essentially, in a normal cell, you have uh, you have a cell membrane, you have some cellular architecture, you have a nucleus, and that nucleus holds its structure, maintains its structure due to a number of a number of reasons, including the presence of proteins called lamins, and these lamins form a network that helps give it elasticity and shape and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. um, and so per, one of the things that, that happens in the pathway to making these lamins is you have a molecule, a sort of sticky molecule, put on the protein at one point and then taken back off at a later point. Uh, why? I don't know. That's how cells do it. And so... In progeria, actually Francis Collins, the, the head of the NIH, made this discovery, um, I think back in the early 90s. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a mutation which allows this sticky protein to persist, and so that accumulates on the inside of the nucleus, um, and it causes a bunch of phenotypes, a bunch of symptoms which result in the dramatically increased aging so that kids who are born with it don't live past their teens. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it's a uniformly fatal disease. And it's characterized by uh, a cardiac, especially by cardiac uh, cardiomyopathy and, 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 and stroke and, and the, the diseases that many older people die of. Um, uh, so happening it's, in the teens. It, happening in the teens. Right, or, so it's definitely accelerated yeah. aging. Yeah, and 
So very, very characteristic phenotype. The cells of those people are also uh, characteristically misshapen. The nuclei have all these these problems with them, outcroppings and blebbings. They don't look like nice sort of oval spheroid nuclei. They they're they're misshapen, and so we're studying cultured cells from uh, progeria or control donors, tissue donors, um, because there are only a few hundred kids with progeria in the United States, period, and, and, and hundreds in the world. But um, anyway, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible disease. We're trying to help a little bit. Others have shown um, that sulforaphane has an effect in reversing the phenotype in sulforaphane. This is Karima Jabali in, great, in uh, Germany showed this a couple of years ago. And we said that we were going to um, look at a number of other isothiocyanates from different plants because sulforaphane, while it was effective in, in reversing this phenotype, also uh, was fairly, it was toxic at, at, at slightly higher levels. So the therapeutic index or the the window in which you could operate uh, and use it as a, as a drug, let's say, was very narrow. So what we're doing is looking at other isothiocyanates, very similar molecules, which we know also activate NRF2, to see if there are some that, that have much greater windows, thresholds of uh, therapeutic, th therapeutic windows. And so, this is specifically in the context of progeria? That specifically was, okay. in the context of progeria. And that's characteristic yeah. of any sort of a hormetic plant compound, yes. is that there's a very small therapeutic window. Or, or not. I mean, there may be, there may be, right. There's a there, window. There's a window. <laughs> there's a window, exactly. And we, we want to find windows that are large, so, uh, right. um, yeah. But so why do I mention progeria in terms of aging? Well, obviously, it's, an, it's a disease of acute aging um, or accelerated aging. Many people seem to think that by understanding a bit more about how we can reverse this phenotype in people with acute aging, that this may also be applicable to normal aging and to sl perhaps slowing down normal aging. It turns out that all of us have some small amount of progerin, this, this protein, in our systems. And I believe the evidence is that it increases somewhat as we age, um, mm. not certainly to the acute levels that you find in kids with progeria. Um, so, so we're using sulforaphane to explore this. Since we got our grant, um, uh, there's a very interesting and I think quite important publication from uh, Tom Mistelli's group at, at the NIH showing um, that in fact NRF2 is very intimately related to this, pr to this process in progeria. Um, and that what happens is that progerin, the sticky protein that I told you is on the inside of the nucleus, actually binds NRF2 as it enters the nucleus to do its signaling thing. Uh, and and it, it gloms it up against the inside of the nucleus, so to speak, so that perhaps one, among, the ch among the chores of sulforaphane or among the functions of sulforaphane are to increase the amount of NRF2 that's coming into the nucleus, certainly, but it may also enhance clearance of mutant proteins um, and, and even progerin from, from the nucleus. So um, there's a huge amount that we don't know there, but it's an exciting, it's an exciting, exciting. approach to studying aging. Yeah, it sounds yeah. like even just the, the mutant progerin would seem 